So I'm really pleased to say that um, we're here with a very prominent figure in the uh, world of uh, Jewish studies and uh, uh, the Jewish community, Rabbi uh, Julia Neuberger. And um, we're here to discuss this um, remarkable woman, Etty Hillison, um, and her really very remarkable Holocaust diary um, written before she perished, um, sadly, in 1943 in Auschwitz. Um, I first came across uh, this diary, uh, Julia, um, when I was about 13 years old and um, sat down and read it and have to be honest, it totally transformed my life, both on spiritual levels, personal levels, to um, find this, this young w woman who um, realised what her fate would be, realised that she would um, be tortured and, and perish in, in Auschwitz, and yet she somehow did not lose touch and, and faith, really, with God and in humanity. Um, I found this profound <laughs> and um, incredibly inspirational. And um, I wondered, when you first came across this diary, did it have a similar effect on you, her, her spiritual trans, uh, transformation this, that, that she made? Eddie Hellison definitely made a spiritual transformation in the course of these diaries that we've got to read and I first um, discovered them, I didn't discover them, I was first sent them, I think as a proof actually by Nicola Bowman of Persephone Books who's published them in this country and I have to say I was probably slightly less moved than you, possibly because I was a lot older when I got them first <laughs> and possibly also because although I think they are absolutely remarkable diaries there is more of a genre mm. of people's diaries, and perhaps I've just seen more of them and been exposed to more of this than, than you had been when you were 13. So I'm not, I'm not as profoundly moved by them, and certainly not, I don't feel that I've been transformed by them, but I do think they are very remarkable, and I do think she must have been a very remarkable young mm. woman. And very particularly, and I would slightly take issue with you about she knew what her fate would be. I think she knew what the beginnings of her mm. fate might be. I don't think she knew the full extent of her fate because I don't think people did. And I certainly don't think the Dutch Jews did. She knew relatively early on mm. that people weren't coming back from the East when they'd been transported from Vesterbork. She also knew, obviously, because most people didn't go back and forward between Vesterbork, the concentration camp, or the, the holding camp in, in Holland, where people went on to concentration camp. Um, she also was one of the rare people who went from Vesterbork back to Amsterdam and back to Vesterbork and back to Amsterdam. So she knew a great deal more about the conditions. Mm -hmm. Did she know really it was extermination? That comes, I think, quite late in the diaries. And did she know how the extermination was going to take place? No, she absolutely didn't. I don't think they knew that it, they were going to be gassed. I don't think that was uh, knowledge for people in Vesterbork or anywhere else. Just before I go on, though, there's one other thing I would like to say, which is my great-grandmother was deported from Vesterbork as well. So it's part of my family Gosh. history. My family were German Jews. Uh, actually, on both sides, they were German Jews. And my father's family mostly came to Britain before the First World War. But my father's grandmother, so my great-grandmother, was still in Frankfurt in Germany. They went to Holland, they thought, for safety, as so many people did, as did Ellie, Etty Hillesum's great inspirer, mm -hmm from, again, from Germany to Holland, and she was deported in her bed to Vesterbork. Gosh. That's, that's um, very interesting that you should uh, share, you know, that I history. Yes. I, 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 mean, I presume that's, I mean, obviously this is all going to be cut, so we I'm, can I'm, I'm do assuming that's how you wanted it. Okay, fine. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting. Tell me if um, I'm going uh, And, uh, yes, I um, agree. I mean, surely, as you say, Jew uh, Etty, um, being a Jewish intellectual, as many other Jews, I'm sure, who lived in Amsterdam in Europe at that time, uh, the Jewish people, of course, were a great contribution to, to society. There were, you know, doctors, academics, you know, um, and um, so why? It, it wouldn't cross their mind as to why <laughs> um, uh, they would, there would be this um, ethnic cleansing against the Jewish people. It, um, I'm sure from that point of view, none of that made any uh, sense whatsoever. I think you've got to be very careful about how you describe what went on in, went, what went on in Holland. First of all, Amsterdam was a very Jewish city. Mm. It was referred to as Makom, originally Hamakom, which mm. means place, the place in Hebrew. It was such a Jewish city, it was a 
you know, pe and pe even in football crowds, when people were cheering for Amsterdam, they used to cheer Macom Macom. So it was very, very much a Jewish place. Secondly, a lot of people, Etty Hillesum included, were very, very assimilated Jews. They didn't really think of themselves hugely as Jewish. Mm -hmm. They certainly weren't practicing, practicing Jews, and I think that's really important. Mm. Um, and the third thing about it, I mean, you know, Amsterdam was quite a, a Jewish place. Nevertheless, when you look at the extent of collaboration with the Nazis amongst European c countries, Holland, contrary to impressions people have, actually comes quite high for collaboration. Uh, and the Jews had a pretty rough time. The numbers of Jews who were hidden was also quite high, mm. but there was a high, high level of collaboration. Mm. Um, just to change the topic slightly, um, what struck me as being um, extremely um, unusual and, and um, quite special is that, of course, two of the major religions, being both Judaism and the Catholic Church, um, had have in fact wanted to claim Etty Hillism for themselves, as it were, and um, I'm sure fought over <laughs> whether she was Jewish or could, because of course she, she read, um, she understood the New Testament and, and, and in, indeed um, related to many, um, <laughs> um, uh, it was very meaningful, the, many of the New Testament um, uh, writings as well as the Old uh, Testament. So, do you view her as Christian as well as <laughs> Jewish in that no, sense? No, I view or? her. Um, it, clearly, Etty Hillison was very interested in Christianity, and particularly mm -hmm. Catholicism, as mm -hmm. many, many people of her generation were. I certainly had a, a great uncle who equally was fascinated by Catholicism, got lots of his letters, he also perished. Um, it was common. I mean, it was common in Germany, it was common in Holland, it was common probably in Britain for people who were Jewish and were fairly assimilated as Jews to also be interested in Christianity, mm. as indeed one would hope that they might be. Mm. But did they convert? I think the majority of them did not convert to Christianity. They weren't baptized. And I think the important thing is that, you know, in the end she ended up working for the Jewish Council and threw her lot in with the Jews. I mean, she didn't have a great deal of choice, although she did have points where she might have been able to escape and decided not to, and she decided to share the destiny. I think the other thing that's important is that Sometimes the Catholic Church has tried to claim people who were Jews. Um, <laughs> there's a particular issue with Edith Stein, who was claimed as a, a, a Catholic, uh, well, it's a, essentially a saint. And uh, I do find that rather difficult because Edith Stein didn't die because she was a Catholic. Mm. She died because she was, by heredity anyway, mm. if not by practice or by belief, she was a Jew. Mm. Yes, I tend to agree, I think. Um, but saying that, Detty did have certainly saintly attributes, you could say. I mean, she was deeply altruistic, um, n naturally so, I believe. And, and Yang Garland's introduction, of course, um, beautifully uh, describes this side of her. Um, in fact, I'm sure Etty Hillison would have, had no, would have had absolutely no idea we would be speaking of her virtues 60 years on. Um, yet, you know, she the, the last two years of her life or so, she really did um, uh, use the majority of her energies to, to help her um, friends and family and those in the in Wester Bork and, and the, the um, holding camps. Um, this, this very giving nature and, uh, and truly altruist, altruistic um, uh, personality, I think, shone through, didn't it? I think her virtues absolutely shine through out of her writings, and she clearly was highly devoted to fellow Jews in Westerbork and tried to get help her family and her friends. And I mean, the one of the tragedies of it all, and it's a huge family tragedy when you read of them, and quite apart from much bigger tragedy, but the family tragedy is that you know nobody survived. One brother survived, mm. made it to the very end of the war to Bergen Belsen, and died on his journey back to Holland. And you just think, you know, so so nobody was left. And I think that was quite common, but that we've got her diaries and that mm. it's, you know, it is of the time mm. and that she knew in some sense that she, she knew completely, I think, that she wasn't coming back mm. and then made sure that her diaries survived, although then it took so long for her diaries to be published mm. and cleaned up and published and now in many languages. Um, I think it's terrific that we can read her diaries nearly 70 years after her death. Mm. I think the sadness for me is I suspect that there were many other people yes. 
keeping diaries, mm. many other people who maybe have been as altruistic, and plenty who were absolutely I'm nothing sure. like as altruistic <laughs> as she was, but well. other people who were really wonderful, sure. and we know nothing about no. them. And I think one of the things that I feel so strongly about this diary, why I, feel, why I love it so much, mm. is it's, it's obviously very much a personal thing and about her, but it's also a monument, actually, to the strength of the human spirit in a mm. much more general way. And I really love that. And mm. I think it's really important that people read it. Mm. And I think it's important that people read it as much as they read, you know, the diary of Anne Frank, which everybody knows. Mm. I think this is of a, a different order. And obviously, she was much older and much more sophisticated. And I think people ought to read it. Mm. It's interesting you should um, make that um, comparison because, of course, Anne Frank's diary, I actually read it, uh, I think, at um, a similar age to this diary. And um, both uh, were incredibly sophisticated women, actually. Anne Frank, for her age, incredibly sophisticated. But, of course, um, Etty Hillison, being uh, a good decade or so older, did have um, a number of hormones, <laughs> I'm sure, running through her system that um, Anne Frank didn't. And, of course, she had um, all these rather complex relationships with, <laughs> with the men, <laughs> which we won't go into because it's probably not necessarily spiritually um, uh, relevant But um, for this, unless you feel it is. <laughs> but, I didn't no. <laughs> Um, I, on a more, I don't know um, how recently you've, you've read the text, um, but um, when I was reading the text um, through on a more analytical uh, level, it seemed to me that her writing is, of course, so beautiful and poetic and very philosophical throughout. Um, and of course, nearer the end, it becomes very clear through the actual use of her language, it becomes somehow less coherent and, and fragmented somehow, and, and you can sense her real depression and anxiety and, and fear. Um, but there is one excerpt nearer the end in 1943, um, an excerpt, um, excerpt she writes, which um, I found very profound and um, seemed to... Um, illuminate itself for me somehow and which caught my attention and she writes some some people are born into this world with a soul 15 years old and others hundreds uh, mine feels thousands years old I feel as though I've been here a thousand times before I found this extremely interesting <laughs> as a comment and um, uh, as I say in fact I, I mentioned to you a little earlier that we belong to a study society where P.D. Ospensky taught and, and um, of course his um, school of thought um, which it, it's not so much um, a bit too noisy <laughs> sorry um, perhaps isn't so relevant to Judaism but um, the yeah. whole idea of um, uh, eternal recurrence not so much reincarnation but that whole sense of um, really having a soul that can um, develop you know, a, a, and is almost predestined in the sense you're born with a, a, a developed uh, essence and, and character, as it were. And do you believe in any of that as no. such? No, I don't believe in any of that. <laughs> and I don't think that's what she was saying. No, okay. um, I mean, I think I take a much more a particular view of it. And I think that what she was saying when she thought she'd been there a thousand times before mm. was actually a reflection on what happens to the Jews. Mm. And that persecution of no, the Jews had happened over mm. many, okay, many, mm. many hundreds of years in many different mm. ways. And actually, I, I, I think you're right when you say that the tone changes completely, I think, towards the end of the 1943 sections. I, she's in vestibule. She's not going back to Amsterdam anymore. The conditions are getting worse. They're constantly in the mud. People are ill. It's really horrible. She feels this is about persecution. She thinks the guards are beasts. She's beginning to be really quite nasty about the Germans, which she isn't much earlier on. And I think she's reflecting on what it means to be Jewish. And mm. I think it's about, this is where Jews have been. She knew about, after all, she knew about pogroms. Her mother had actually come, fled from a pogrom in Russia, as far as we know. And uh, I think this is about, you know, this has happened thousands of times before. I'm not sure it's the same kind of reflection on the nature of the soul at all. Mm. I think it's much more a reflection on the nature of the human, and in this case, Jewish, Jewish. condition. Mm. And I think it's really important because what changes in her tone is it becomes sort of staccato mm. uh, and much less lyrical. Mm. And it's staccato. You also feel it's almost like gunshot. Mm. And um, I think that's what she was hearing. I think a lot of what comes out at the end is a reflection on what she's hearing, what's all around her, and her own, I think, not inconsiderable fear, although that's not what she 
really reflects in her writing. But you know, I don't think people were in Vesterborg without being afraid. Mm. It was a question of when you were going to be deported, not whether you were mm. going to be. And so it was always, you know, when is it going to be my turn? Mm. Yes, and it's interesting that, as you say, when she comments on, on being into this world, she felt that, you know, she was born in, into this world a thousand years, or at least she's been there a thousand years, yeah. um, a thousand times before. In fact, it's interesting that she, as I'm sure many other Jews, probably felt more and more Jewish and identified themselves as being more and more Jewish. The fact that they were, that the, their whole community was um, suffering perhaps t in, in, in this way? Or I think it's more complicated than... Um, just identifying more and more Jewishly. They're forced to identify mm. more and more Jewishly because increasingly they have no contact with people who aren't Jewish. Mm. Of course, one of the things that would have been true for Etty Hillesum and many other people is that they would have been forced into Vesterbork and into very, very tight space. I mean, the mm. place was built originally for German Jews coming across the border into Holland. Mm. It was built for, say, 1,500, 2,000 people, and they, you know, they had 40, 50,000 more in there. Um, I think it was more about you were forced to associate and be at very close quarters with, mm -hmm. far closer than one would normally want to in terms of one's personal space, with Jews who were very different. Mm -hmm. you know, Jews who came from Eastern Europe, very, very different traditions, much mm -hmm. more observant Jews, or people who are much less observant or whatever. You didn't have a choice but to identify as Jewish. Mm -hmm. So you began to sort of say to yourself, well, what does this mean? And I think some of, some of that, and I think you get that earlier in her writing, earlier in 43, is some of it, you know, what does this all mean? Mm. What does it mean to be part of this community of which I only feel wholly, a, you know, mm. half a part? Mm. I don't feel wholly a part. And yet she was working for the Jewish Council, a job that she'd got through some kind of connections anyway, mm. because otherwise, you know, many of them didn't have jobs at all, any mm. means of any mm. means of sustenance. Mm. And um, it, psychologically, I, I think it's very interesting that not that I understand much of the history of the Second World War, but of course, Hitler and the Nazi Party, of course, stigma stigmatized the, the Jewish people, first of all, um, claiming they were amoral, immoral, and also mentally unwell in many cases, or at least they tend to, to categorise the Jewish people in that light in order to perhaps begin their ethnic, ethnic cleansing. Do you believe that had there been other minority groups in Europe at that point in time, in, uh, including Holland, that um, they would have had a similar fate to the Jewish community? Well, other minority groups did, and yeah, particularly... Yeah.